the port. Welcome also to all those who follow us on Zoom and all those who follow us on our website, www.pressclub.ch, as well as on uh, our YouTube channel and uh, Facebook Live. So uh, we are here for this uh, press conference. Uh, we are going to talk about the situation of human rights in, uh, specifically in China and in Pakistan today. And um, without taking too much time, I will just uh, give you and pass you the golden book to, to be signed by all the speakers. Thank you very much. You can just sign it here. And, um, and I will, with not waiting more, directly give the speech for this session. There will be some films also that will be showed. I will give the floor in this session to Mr. Sital. Mr. Sital is the founder and chairman of uh, Global Human Rights Defense. The floor is yours, Mr. Sital. Hello. Thank you all for uh, joining us in this uh, prestigious club in Geneva. Thank you, sir, for introducing us. And um, we are here to, uh, to highlight the human rights violation in two countries. GHD is an uh, NGO in the Netherlands, in The Hague, and we are focusing on minority rights across the world. But uh, as you know, in this past conference, we just want to focus on two countries. Um, my team is, uh, we have a very uh, young team very dynamic team. They are working with heart and they are very motivated also. And I'm always proud that my team can explain about human rights violation in country where they have never been, but they are so motivated that they can tell sometimes more than the people who live there. So if you want to know more about GHRD, uh, please check our website. And um, after that, I'm available for questions, but we are now more than 21 years old. We have the ECOSOC status, and um, at this moment, there are more than 40 nationalities working for us, and on a daily basis, we have almost 85 volunteers on academic level in our organization. Means that we have the youngest uh, staffing and volunteers I think because of my age, I bring the level down. <laughs> but uh, hopefully new, new leaders will come up and take my place. Uh, I'm really honored to say that one person who can really uh, know about Pakistan and she will speak on behalf of GHRD on Pakistan is Emma. And I will ask her to give a brief what GHRD is doing with Pakistan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sital. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining here today and also the people online. My name is Emma Barnard and I'm the coordinator for Team Pakistan at Global Human Rights Defense. My team and I, we conduct research and we voice the concerns for the atrocities and the human rights violations committed against minorities and marginalized groups in Pakistan. Think of women and children, disabled children, religious minorities such as the Hindus and the Christians but also the LGBTQ plus community. They continuously face issues such as forced conversions, forced marriages, honor killings, and a discriminatory application of the blasphemy laws. We have extensively focused on issues such as child labor. Research has shown that since 1996, at least 3.3 million children in Pakistan are trapped in the child labor industry, simultaneously being deprived of their health, education, and childhood. Following that, we also focused on the lack of access to education for children in Pakistan. In 2020 alone, UNICEF estimated that 22.7 million children are unable to attend school. Our research has also shown that especially girls are deprived of access to education. In fact, 32% of girls in Pakistan are not attending school for various reasons. We find that the lack of public funding is the main culprit only 2.8% of Pakistan's GDP is allocated towards education. Global Human Rights Defense firmly believes that the international community and the Pakistani government must prioritize 
their young citizens' ability to attend school. Because we have to remember that the children of today will be the leaders of tomorrow. tomorrow. So proper, affordable and accessible education is key. Violence against women and children in Pakistan is an ever-growing problem that needs to be addressed and needs urgent attention. Estimates tell us that 32% of Pakistani women have experienced some form of physical violence, uh, whether on the streets or in the workplace. 40% of women suffer from domestic abuse, which then risks being normalized in the eyes of their daughters. This problem needs to be tackled as soon as possible, and we applaud the already positive developments that have taken place, such as locator apps like the Punjab Safe City Authority Women Safety App. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to the violence committed against the LGBTQ plus community, especially the transgender population. Despite growing attentions and laws protecting trans rights, people still face a stigma, poverty and murder. Research shows that the nation's damaging colonial past, which left an anti-LGBTQ plus legacy throughout Asia, is also to blame. While there are progressive laws in Pakistan that protect the rights of transgenders, such as recognizing their transgender identity on national cards, transgender people are often disowned by their family. As a result, 51% of the transgender community work in the sex industry or they beg on the streets, both of which have been outlawed in Pakistan. Global Human Rights Defense asks the international community to pay more attention to the ongoing issues in Pakistan in their foreign policy. We focus and we will continue to use our voice to help marginalized minorities in Pakistan by giving a voice to those who continue to be unheard. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. I would like to welcome everybody um, on behalf of Global Human Rights Defense once again. My name is Lina Borchardt. I am overlooking the promotion and event team at uh, Global Human Rights Defense. And today I will try my best to introduce our speakers. Um, to you. First of all, uh, thanks again, Emma. I think uh, she is one of the colleagues that can give you a little bit of an insight into our work at Global Human Rights Defense. As Ital mentioned, uh, we're quite a young team and uh, we have a delegation here in Geneva as well. And uh, I think you can meet us again after, after this press conference and get to know each, each other. So I think we should start with the first uh, item on the agenda, um, the Uyghur um, movie, which is a movie presented to all of us um, on this human rights situation in China um, regarding the Uyghur population there. Thank you very much. Life in darkness, the abduction, forced conversion and forced marriages of minority girls are common practices in Pakistan. An estimated 1,000 minority girls are forced into such marriages every year. From them, up to 700 are Christians and 300 are Hindus. These minority girls are usually between the age of 12 to 25, abduction, converted to Islam and married to abductor or by a third party. Hindu ladki usko kidnap karke forced conversion karke aur kidnap kar liya gaya aur uske maa baap jo hai wo bechare ro rahe hain khade har jagah pe darwaze khad kar aa rahe hain ki hamari koi insaaf ho aur ye pata nahi chal raha ki wo ladki jo hai usko kaise kidnap kiya aur kaise conversion hui phir zabardasti shaadi hui ya nahi hui dar asal is qisam ke jo cases hote hain ye 90% ladki ko utha liya jata hai acha usko qanoon ke tahat usko जिसे बिस्मिल्लाह रहमान रहीम मैं मुसलमान हूं करवा के फिर कलमा पढ़वा के और उसके बाद जिंसी ज्यादती की जाती है वो उसको ये कहा जाता है कि तुमसे शादी हो गई है तुम मुसलमान बन गई हो शादी हो गई है और उसके बाद ताकि इनको फिर हाथ ना कोई लगा सके ये कहा जाए कि ये तो खुद आई है और ये कन्वर्ट हो गई है अब मेरी बीवी है इससे ज्यादा वो और वो अदालतें और पुलिस वो बड़े सिंपैथेटिक होते हैं कि जी किसी एक धैर्य को या एक इनफिडेल को आपने मुसलमान बना दिया इससे ज्यादा क्या आपको जन्नत नसीब होगी क्या ये एक माहौल बनाया हुआ है मगर एक्चुअली इसके पीछे जो है वो बिल्कुल एक ज्यादती है उसके पीछे इसका कोई मजहब के साथ तल्लुक नहीं है मजहब को इस्तेमाल किया जा रहा है और फिर उसके बाद क्या होता है ये आज तक किसी ने नहीं आपको बताया मगर जो 90 परसेंट केसेस हैं जो रिपोर्ट से आए होती हैं ऐसी लड़कियां अगर वो अपने माँ बाप के पास ना जाएं या ना वो माँ बाप वापस ले सके उन्हें 
تو وہ دو تین چار چار مہینے کے بعد وہ جو شخص جس نے ان کے ساتھ شادی کی ہوئی ہوتی ہے یہ لڑکیاں غائب ہو جاتی ہیں یہ ان کے پاس بھی نہیں رہتی اور اگر ان سے پوچھا جائے کہ یہ لڑکی آپ نے شادی کی تھی کنورٹ کیا تھا وہ کہاں گئی تو آگے سے جواب نہیں ملتا نوے فیصد کیسز میں یہ لڑکیاں جو ہیں یہ غائب ہو جاتی ہیں یا مار دی جاتی ہیں یا ان کو پروسٹیٹیوشن میں دھکیل دیا جاتا ہے اور پھر وہ چھپاتی پھرتی ہیں کہ ان کے ساتھ کیا ہوا کیونکہ وہ بےزتی ہے یا اس قسم کی بات اور خاندان بھی اس کو چھپا دیتا آفٹر سچ انسیڈنٹ وین فیملی آف وکٹم فائل ایف آئی آر فار ابڈکشن اور ریپ آف دیئر ڈاٹر ایٹ لوکل پولیس اسٹیشن ابڈکٹر آن بہاف آف دا ابڈکٹیڈ گرل آلسو فائل اکاؤنٹر ایف آئی آر اکیوزنگ دی مائنورٹی فیملی فار ہریسنگ دا ولفلی کنورٹیڈ اینڈ میرڈ مائنورٹی گرل اینڈ کنسپائرنگ ٹو کنورٹ دا گرل بیک ٹو کرسچینٹی اور ہندوازم اپان پروڈکشن ان کورٹ اور بفور دا میجسٹریٹ دا وکٹم گرل از آرک ٹو ٹیسٹیفائی ویدر شی از کنورٹیڈ and married of her own free will or if she was abducted in most cases the girl remains in the custody of the abductor while judicial proceedings are carried out in such cases when girl is presented in the court she is under influence of the abductor this results in her statement that she has willfully converted and married to the abductor the case is settled without any relief for the victim family While in the custody of the abductor, the victim girl may be subjected to sexual violence, rape, forced prostitution, human trafficking, sale and other domestic abuses. In such cases, justice is violated. The abducted girl do according to the instructions of the abductor. The abductor blackmails the abducted girl for recording false statement. So the girl record a false statement in front of the police authority, court and family. The case of Hindu girl married to Muslim boy was brought to Islamabad High Court. In the proceeding, Justice Shokat Aziz Siddiqui said that all are equal in the sight of law. Don't kill the girl for embracing Islam. Married according to her will, lawyer of the boy said husband of Maria Bilawali Bhutto and his family is being accused of abduction and theft. This is all just a game of the work. They will kill them. They will kill them in any way. They will kill them in any way. Maria told that she has willfully converted to Islam. No one has forced her. Girls should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. We should be allowed to meet her parents. demanded Maria recited the holy kalma of Islam. Court said on next hearing, Maria has to meet her parents in court. Sindh ka is vaqt koi bhi aisa shahar nahi hai jahaan se hindu naujwano ko taawan ke liye agwa kiya ja raha hai aur dousri taraf سندھ کی ہندو بیٹیوں کو جس طرح دن دھاڑے اغوا کیا جا رہا ہے اور ان کا جس طرح مذہب تبدیل کیا جا رہا ہے رینکل کماری کو رات کو دو بجے اس کے گھر سے اغوا کیا گیا اس اغوا کے بعد جب ایف آئی آر کٹوانے ان کے رشتے دار پہنچے تو وہ ایف آئی آر نہیں کاٹی گئی روڈوں پہ نکلنے کے بعد بمشکل وہ ایف آئی آر کاٹی گئی اس درمیان میں جو ڈی پی او کا کردار رہا یہاں بیٹھے ہوئے میرے جو اقلیت سے تعلق رکھتے ہیں ایم این اے میرے بھائی ہر ایم این اے نے کوشش کری ڈی پی او سے بات کرنے کی لیکن وہ ڈی پی او کسی کا فون اٹھانا گوارا نہیں کر رہا تھا یہ کچھ فوٹوز ہیں جو وہاں کھینچے گئے تھے اس لڑکی کو جب گھوٹکی کی عدالت میں پیش کیا گیا 
تو اس نے واضح اسٹیٹمنٹ دی کہ میں اپنے ماں باپ کے ساتھ جانا چاہتی ہوں لیکن وہی طور طریقے انتظامیہ کے کیونکہ اس ایم این اے صاحب کا پریشر تھا Probably most of you have noticed that was not the movie that I announced. That was not uh, the Uyghur situation in China, but the Pakistan movie. I will uh, now therefore change the order of the uh, speakers so we are um, in line with the content. Which is why I would like to introduce Mr. Uh, Luhana, the uh, General Secretary of the World Sindhi Congress. Um, the floor is yours. First and foremost, I'm really grateful to the GHRD and to Mr. Seetal Satanand and the team of GHRD, enabling us to send our voice of suffering and pain to all of you and through you to the entire world. Today's topic is human rights situation in China and Pakistan. So because it's five minutes, I have to be really very, very uh, precise. So the sequence of my uh, statement would be just to provide you what is Sindh, what is Pakistan, what is happening in that part of the world with Sindhis, and most importantly, why it matters to the world. Now I'll tell you, sometime go back and to see in Google, Sindh is one of the oldest countries in the world. Sindh is one of the oldest countries in the world and we belong to the Indus civilization, which is, is one of the most ancient civilizations of the world. For thousands of years, fast forwarding to 1843, when the Sindh was an independent country, was captured by the British Empire. Fast forwarding to 1947, when subcontinent, without consulting, and understanding even that point in time, the right to self-determination wasn't enshrined in the charter without considering the wishes of the nations, the subcontinent was divided. And unfortunately, Sindh came to Pakistan and that was the start of a very darkest era. Coming back to current Sindh, fast forwarding 75 years, Sindh, according to the official figures, provides 70% of the resources of the wealth of the revenue of Pakistan, 70%. 72% of gas of Pakistan, 64% of oil of Pakistan, sixth largest coal deposits of, of, I mean, of the world, worth $23 trillion. And to that country that produces 70% percent, the situation is, Emma was talking about the girls' education. Officially, the Sindh government says that there are 7 million children. That is almost the population of many European countries, 7 million children in Sindh under the age of 10, they are out of education. The real figures that we, we, we, we uh, gathered, the Female education is a, not there are 36 percent, 37 percent of there are more there are more than two thirds, more than 67 percent of girls they are out of education. 
there are 80% of the schools they don't have water or sanitation facilities according to the supreme court the drinking water that the people of sindh use 80% of people that not suitable for animal consumption even not not even what not suitable for animal consumption and creating a literally a pandemic of disease of hepatitis of tuberculosis and on the other hand they are they are taking our millions of acres of land they are settling people from outside so sindh could be converted into minor sindhis could be cannot converted into minority on their own motherland and currently 60% of the youth who are passed through universities they are out of employment the level of malnutrition according to the un 70% of people in sindh suffer from malnutrition on average 10 children die of malnutrition every day in sindh and that is a sin and then if you raise the voice you are abducted you are gone you are missing there are isko hundreds of sindhis sindhi youth who are missing and uh, uh, for for for for many many years at the time of partition sindhi hindus made 29% of population of sindh and today they are only 6% but the way the atrocities are being committed they are leaving and you are talking about in this documentary heart wrenching about the conversion of girl yesterday a 9 year old girl a 9 year old girl she has been abducted and forced convert can you believe that and coming back to the pakistan if you are in any uh, understanding that is a country run by the democratic system no from day one pakistan has been run by the military and military and military there is no institution there is no parliament there is no no judiciary there is no even press they all are controlled very very uh, heavily by the army army is the largest corporate company of pakistan they run if they tomorrow they want to remove one they bring the governments they remove the governments and that is what is happening and i tell you one thing that why it matters to you because pakistan has is has the sixth largest army in the world pakistan has got the largest per capita soldiers in the world pakistan has you has got an army of 2 to 3 million religious uh, uh these terrorists and extremists 2 to 3 million there is no other comparable army in the world and they can create havoc on the world just to go back and see that the uh, the the demonstrations and protest how vicious against france by the tehreek labek pakistan in that in the, these protest number of people were killed even from the police and these people were released they don't have only tehreek labek pakistan they have scores of religious extremist groups and they are now the world knows they are the proxies of the pakistani army and they don't only create uh, uh, this this situation against the nations which are oppressed in pakistan like sindhis and balochs and pashtuns they create the instability say for example afghanistan who created taliban you need to know this is the pakistan who did that now after 20 years of us being there these these taliban came back so they were capable and they were celebrating even the pakistan's prime minister was very happy that they were victorious Dr. they Muhammad. were capable to bring that so it is this this uh, religious fundamentalism is spreading and this is reaching to your doors just go back and so i tell you one thing it is your time like during the time of second world war there was holocaust and they didn't have the voice we the sindhi people we and the baloch people we don't have the voice you become our voice it is your responsibility it is the responsibility of the international community is the responsibility of any human being who believe in human dignity and human human uh, uh, human, human human rights that they should raise our voice and to raise tell the world what atrocities and why it matters to you thank you very much
Thank you very much. We're sorry that we have to cut you short, but we have a limited amount of time. Um, once again, I am uh, forced to improvise because Mr. Dokun Isa, who will join us here today online, the president of the World Oigo Congress, has to uh, attend another meeting. So I would like to th uh, welcome him via live stream. We will um, later on show the movie on the Oigo uh, genocide as well. Thank you for your patience. Can I start? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much again. And as has become a clear by now, current situation of the Uyghur people has never been more urgent. The Uyghur suffering incredible as the action of the Chinese government has put very existence of Uyghur people on the street. In the last five years alone, Chinese government has subject Uyghur people to mass arbitrary detention, millions of Uyghur, Kazakh, and other people in concentration camp, where they are subject to severe abuse, such as torture and the gender-based violence. Masterialization and the forced abortion of Uyghur women and other birth prevention measures in order to diminish Uyghur population. Forced labor and the modern slavery of hundreds of thousands of Uyghur people, attempt to destroy unique Uyghur identity and forcibly assimilate the Uyghur people into hand-centric China. Destruction, physical repression of the Uyghur identity, including thousands of mosques, graviers, and the other side of religious, cultural, and historical importance to the Uyghur people. Bans Uyghur, use the Uyghur language in many schools and public space. Separating Uyghur children from their family may estimate that around 1 million Uyghur children separate from family to indoctrinate them to be loyal to the Chinese Communist Party and to forsake their Uyghur identity. Harassment, punishment, Uyghur diaspora, and anyone who dares speak out. Taken together, Chinese Communist Party trying to destroy and erase Uyghur people. We are expressing and the genocide and this finally being recognized by international community as a response to this crisis, nine national parliaments in the world recognize Uyghur genocide. Following past resolution, US, UK, Canada, Netherlands, Lithuania, Belgium, Czech Republic, France, Ireland, as well as officially recognized by the US government. In December 2021, the independent Uyghur tribunal confirmed, uh, confirmed this allegation in its final judgment, highlighting the legal, legal obligation that signatories of the UN Genocide Convention must prevent Uyghur genocide from happening. The test, test, uh, uh, testimonies at the Uyghur Tribunal have shown that behind each million of Uyghur people affected by CCP genocide policy against Uyghurs, a family, and friends who love Swam. I personally lost both of my parents under mysterious circumstances in the past year due to the CCP policy. My mother died in the concentration camp in 2018. They have sentenced my younger brother to life imprisonment, my older brother to a long sentence, and forced my remaining family member to denounce me. Nearly every Uyghur has family st stories uh, and the lost on the pain. What is happening Uyghur is spreading other peoples in China too. Repressive techniques tested Uyghurs are now being used the crash distance in the Hong Kong and the uh, several land technology being exported abroad. Chinese government is undermining human rights in the UN and threatening human rights and freedom around the world. In 1948, international community formally recognized and the quantify the concept of human rights in the UN Declaration of the Human Rights, promising to work together, create a world without violence, discrimination, and genocide. In August 2018, UN Committee on Elimination of Radical Discrimination provides and explores on the de detention of at least 1 million Uyghur in detention camp and the widespread right violation. Third review, institutions of Uyghur marks turning point 
in the recognition of Uyghur crisis by international community. In June 2020, 50 UN experts and special reporters issued jointly communication their increasing concern on the human rights violation in Turkestan. In November 24, 2021, third sent a follow-up letter to Chinese request comment and action of several issues. Last week, World Uyghur Congress jointly nearly 200 NGOs is an open letter urging UN High Commissioner for Human Rights for publish her report on the Uyghur issue. The High Commissioner has been requesting access to the region since 2018 without success. In September 2021, Madam Bachelet confirmed that her office was finalizing its assessment of the available information on allegation of the serious human rights violation in, the, uh, in, uh, in Turkestan with a view to making public. In December, spokesperson of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights said report would be released in a matter of weeks. However, during the her report of the Council last week, High Commissioner has announced her office has reached an agreement with the Chinese government for visit in the May. It is extremely concerning that she has not been transparent of this process and the condition of the visit. The visit should also not be an excuse not to publish the report. It's undermined credible of her office to believe China will allow the unfettered the meaningful access that will allow the human rights defender, victim, and the, their family to speak High Commissioner openly and satisfied. This is con in this context, context, High Commissioner should engage meaningful for the Uyghur group. The organization around the uh, and condition of her. Can you still hear us? Yes, I hear you. Were you finished? I'm sorry, the connection on our side was a little bit bad. Yes, I'm finished. Thank you so much then. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Thank you. So in order not to confuse the people present in this hall and our viewers um, any further, I would like to stick to the uh, Chinese um, topic of the day, and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Marco uh, Respinti, who actually traveled here today, um, which we're very thankful for. Uh, for those who don't know him, he's the director in charge of Bitter Winter magazine. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. China is a totalitarian state, which, where people exist only as functions of the ruling elite. Basic rights are blatantly denied, and liberty is severely restricted as a mere concession of the government for the sake of the government itself. In China, the government is in fact not instituted for serving the common good, but it is merely the other name of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, undemocratically in power since October 1st, 1949, and responsible for millions and millions of deaths possibly killer number one in all human history. The only historical rival of the CCP is the in this staggering slaughter of human beings is fellow communist Soviet Union. But while the USSR is gone, communist China is still there and growing in the world prominence. Surviving the historical failure and tragic collapse of communism, quite able to revitalize its own liberty side system and animated by pungent content for ethnic minorities, women and children, I find no other name for this hell on earth today than neo-post-national communist China. As you, as you just heard, I arrived this morning from Italy, my country, and, I, and now I could go back. All that is relevant is contained in the sentences that I just pronounced. All that is worth, worth saying on China is already there. But if shortness 
is a virtue in public speaking. Sometimes evident truths deserve to be furtherly sounded out to be fully appreciated in all their profoundness, or as in our case today, in all their horrors. I go directly to the negation of basic human rights in China. Human rights are not what international meetings, political majorities, and government commissions decide for the simple reason that what international meetings, political majorities, majorities and government commissions decide, come and go, are bestowed on people today just to be turned down tomorrow. These are no rights. These are grants. To be rights, they should be undeniable, unalienable, untouchable. They must be inherent to the human being. They must proceed from the human nature. So for the very reason of being a human being distinguishable from any other living being or non-living object, a human being is entitled to certain intangible and sacrosanct and even taboo rights that no fellow human right, uh, no fellow human being, no group, no organization, no political or economic force, no state and no church can curtail and challenge, repudiate or veto. Chief and first among the rights that the human being is entitled to by his or her very nature is religious freedom for the simple reason that all human beings have the right to know the truth and the nature of, of the truth focused upon by religions, faiths, creeds and beliefs is supreme. In recognizing the existence of, a, of God, a highest being or spiritual entity or in denying it, denying it resides the ultimate and total sense of one's life. For this reason, religious freedom is the first liberty of man and the right to its exercise is the fundamental human rights from which all subsequent rights, expressions, association, education, ownership, etc. derive. But if it is so foundational for all human activity, since it is centered on the most seminal question of all, religious liberty has serious consequences. Believing or not believing in God, following or not following a spiritual way, has a tremendous impact on human behavior. It essentially influences the way in which people live, associate with others, animate society, do education, politics, economics, in one world, all human activity. activity. In fact, Religious liberty is not only the freedom to worship, but also to live according to one's belief. The gentle organizer of this important press conference today, the Club Suisse de la Presse, and the Global Human Rights Defense invited me to speak here today in my capacity of director in charge of Bitter Winter, an online magazine on religious liberty and human rights all over the world, whose core business remains anyway China. In China today, there is what we call the war on the very idea of God. Communist China has always judged religion as unnatural and thus sooner or later doomed to extinction. While awaiting for this fate, the CCP has contributed to reaching the extinction of religion with varying, varying degrees of harshness depend, depending on times, leaders, national and international contexts. The new era of Xi Jinping favors a rapid acceleration with a direct assault on faiths, both those banned or somewhat tolerated and those approved and controlled by the state. This means only one thing. The CCP considers God its very enemy. Why? Because God is a direct rival of the CCP. Believers are increasingly compelled to remove and destroy religious images, to substitute them with portraits of Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping himself. They are Jesus God. The communist regime in Albania, one of the worst of all history, declared itself the first atheistic state in the, of the world in 1967 and waged explicitly war on the very idea of God in its 1976 constitution. The CCP is doing it again today, in spite of the fact that the Chinese constitution grants, nominally, religious freedom. 
God must become extinct. In the meantime, the Chinese government is making believers become extinct. Now, in China, not all religions, religious persecution is the same. There are nuances. In fact, we go from the awful situation for faiths, creeds, and belief to appalling condition for believers. The best description of the religious landscape in today's China remains the three markets model suggested by Chinese sociologist Fegan Yang in 2006, that Bitter Winter, the magazine I'm honored to be the director in charge of, adopted since the beginning. Fegan Yang wittily proposes to recognize a red market, a gray market, and a black market for faiths and the organized, organized religions in China under the CCP rule. Let me just briefly explain. The red marker market includes the only five religious organizations approved by the regime, the Buddhist, Taoist, and Muslim association controlled by the government, and the Protestant Three Self and Catholic Patriotic Churches, whose leaders are appointed by the CCP. In this way, the party controls such large groups of believers from within. We then have the black market, which is the, the, the kingdom, so-called, of the Xie Jiao. Xie Jiao is an old Chinese expression, meaning um, heretic, um, uh, heterodox teachings. Nowadays, the CCP is reviving that expression, Xie Jiao, to translate it improperly as evil cults. So the black market is the place where the, Ch the CCP puts all uh, the, the, the so-called Xie Jiao, the cults, uh, which are cults only by definition of the state. There is no scientific agreement on, on what a cult is. And in China, uh, you are a cult of Xie Jiao only if you belong to a list, which is a list made uh, by the Chinese state of cults. So it's a revolving thing that goes in this way. So the red market, the, uh, the black market, in, the, in, uh, in, in between we have the gray market of religions, which is um, uh, the, the area where the, um, the state, the CCP, is not able to control directory, directly uh, religions or is not able to crush them directly, so it, uh, it, it, uh, it consider them illegal, but it does not have the force right now to crush on them. I have a, a longer text that is available for you if, you if you want with a lot of data, but I want just to point out, as I, and I'm going to conclude, the staggering case of the of um, a large religious group in China, which is completely, almost completely unknown abroad, and for this reason is co constantly <laughs> harassed by, by the CCP because no one is paying attention. It, it, it is called the Church of Almighty God. Uh, the 2021 annual report of, on victims of that group is, has just been released. You find the, a, um, a review on bitter winter. I have some uh, of numbers here which I won't bother you with now, but it's staggering. The, the human toll that this group is, is, uh, is paying. Another famous in China group is the Falun Gong. Falun Gong has been the victim of human harvest, harvesting, meaning they consider them enemy of the state. They put them to jail. They um, sentence them to death and they take organs out of their bodies, sometimes when they're still alive, to feed the, black, the huge black market of uh, human transplants. The China Tribunal in London, a popular uh, court of law whose ruling arrived in March 2020, found the CCP guilty of crimes against humanity in this field. And the sentence is a 500 pages report on this. Uh, we heard from Dolkunes, uh, my good friend about um, Uyghurs, Xinjiang, that they call East Turkestan, is becoming an open air concentration camps. And the CCP calls that, call us as fake uh, news. But uh, we, have, um, we, we have videos, we have pictures, there are testimonies. Dolkon is a, is a passed through that. Many friends uh, passed all through that. Uh, 
uh, let me just conclude that CCP is waging a religious total war against all religions. This happens because the CCP is a materialistic god that cannot stand any rival. Humiliation of people is a daily business for this lying god, and the saddest part of the story is that most of the world is content to go hand in hand with it, doing business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rispinti. In order to finish our focus on the human rights situation in China for now, I would like to uh, now start with the movie I promised you earlier on the situation of the Uyghur population. Thank you. Bula şu bizden ahalla topumuz var, şu bir çatta. Aşı toplu oturuş kıldı. Anan ikin şu kime on dokuzuncili kiyaga baktıdı mı? Yani aşı toplu oturuş kıldı. Elki on sekiz yaştan elli dokuz yaş kıçı tuğut yeşildeki kız ayarla. Çanlı oyundaki aşı ambulatıra verip, öyle koş tekşürüş hep verildi. Aşıdan katnesle. Eğer onunla maslaşmayı, hizmet maslaşmayı, elki başka önüm kızanla, karşı kıldı asanla, uruk tukalarla doğru tıkmanla, Bağlarınla doğru tükmenle, çok amaçlı bir masaj işinle gerek, sağ çıkanı koyup tümür olup durdur, sen de yok duruşları var. In the northwest of China, close to Central Asia, is located the Xijiang Uyghurs Autonomous Region. 25 million inhabitants live in this region, which spreads over 1.6 million square kilometers. Numerous ethnic groups are living in Xijiang, and there are a dozen autonomous prefectures and counties. Minorities are majorities in this region, including the Uyghurs, which are Muslims. Kelvin Ursidik, 51, is a former teacher of Chinese. In 2016, she was forced to teach Chinese in Uyghurs camps. During two years, she witnessed physical injuries on her students, heard screams from Torture's room, saw young men and women disappear. Today, she fled China to tell us the story of her people. Yerizler bütünler yıkıda kalay bir payatlı etken kop karan okuyal etken her bir sırada bir taldan yok ne biz adiyal bak ya kona şundan yok ne biz adiyal karsanızla on tal işte katlan oturup dön. En adı ki derizlerde on tal kuruşku bak ya gari birleşildi gamri kuruşka. Şunu ben karab köz yugur tıplamayı bulamış da smut etedik kendine de yanı bırakıl endişe ve hem işçi de şundan hemen o dersin başlayıda bu adamın sınıf kırdım. Ben bu erle lagırda altı ay tutuldum aşağıda. Altı ay şöyle de turistler yanında normalde depsencilikler gibi, normalde azap okubetler gibi, kıyın kıstaklar gibi. Hatta ki aşağıda yurt gibi ekit bağlan, yengedin kevap kan, anadikin tutup kilindiğin. Mesela üçüncü ayın ki jigermistim başlab, dördüncü ayın bırakıcı tutup kilindiğinde kıyın yedi sekiz milyon bu kette daha. Bunların doksan percenti aşu on sekiz yaştan kırk yaş kiçe yaşla kalan on percenti çoğla. Demek ben deseb kendi vaktimde aşk bina, tört kavet binanın on tarafıyla maşında turmeti, ama sol tarafta işkana, işki üçüncü dördüncü kavetle uçuktu, uçuk çıkalı bulgan, düşüp çıkalı bulgan. Çünkü aşk birinci kavet turmenin ki işte lan birle tuvalet var da, aşk op çıkarlan. Adeta hizmetçiler, sahçer birler mesela bizle basak, çünkü ikinci kavetle ki tüpler ki çıkmazdan uçuklamdı. Dikin şu üçüncü ayına cigermistin başla, dördüncü ayına bırakacak. Aşu işkence kavetten başla, üstünden hem ne aşında karışat kılı kılı, derizlan tişlan ram kılı kılı. Şunda tez sürette hem ne türmi gaylandırıyor tuttu. Kiçik işle, ertesi mi normal zor ders öte mi doğru aşı avazla aşında karakal. El payatla vat kan aşında avazla. Her gün üç vak, bir minuttan lam tuvalet kırış, pürstü bağlan iki. Yolu şun bu video sözü tüp. Olay öz başta acıraş durdu. Kendi yana aşı sözü tüp. Videoyu beni ayarlı mışkım 19 şirketken de burnunca aşı takipler bile. İvertip şunu olay ötkencil 12. ayına jigirim tötüden kinlam. Yana aşı yolu şun bile iş kandak. Onun haberini mi alamadım? O hayat mı? O ya akırk etti mi? Onun bilemedim. Ben elki çıkamaktım da. Bek ağırıp gettim dedim. Beş ay şunda kattık. Ağırdım beş ay ağır içeri. Yani ben köp uylandım. Hakikaten iş günü buldu dedik ya. Çünkü tukanı yemeden bir tatlı oldu. Ben aslında uylandım. Benim yolduşum bahat olsa, beten de kalkan, tukanlarım bahat, tutkan öğün bakan çaylarım bahat olsa, kısmet pensiye çıksam, maaşım şunlar yukarı çıktım demeli olsa. Bu hem de kayırıp koyup, 
Hani onun için e, bu kadarını besiş gereken de, ben bu kadar kılışım gerek dedim, şunu da köp oylandım ama benim vicdanım gururum, katli bu nilgı sözüme, bana sükür turuşka yar beğenmedi. Fakat bir çıdık uçakım kalmadı dedim ama o balanın öyle bir şeydir. Balanın öyle bir şey, öyle tuğan turuş çeriyandı mı? Aşı yazsam mı öyle ki, mesela mi karvatla, aşı ne bilirim öyle ki, katlık yedik, bedenlerim gibi patlı. Mer bir yazsam aşı anı smut yetimat kalan öyle ki, eptini göz aldım ki dedi. Ana yani ki meyli ben tamak yiyeyim, meyli çay içeyim, biraz kaç su içsem o, aşılan o su kızlar boğanları, aşılan o mankargan telmürüşleri, aş köz aldım dedim, pakat ketmedi. I would like to proceed with the last in-person speaker we have here today, Dr. Nazir uh, Dashti, who's on my left. Um, he is the executive president of the Baloch Human Rights Council. So the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I will focus and the human rights situation in Baluchistan. Since the occupation of Baluchistan by Pakistan in 1948, the history of the Baluch is a tale of <coughs> blood and tears. To contain the Baluch national struggle for regaining their independence, the Pakistan has unleashed a reign of terror for the last many decades. There are many aspects of human rights violations in Balochistan. Okay. One is the genocide acts, which include the enforced disappearances. The enforced disappearances is the phenomena where the Pakistani military and its security agencies. They pick up human rights activists, political activists, doctors, engineers, students, teachers, and they keep them in communicate for years. Their families, their friends, they, are, they don't know their whereabouts or the fates of their loved ones. There is a conservative estimate of 4,833 persons which have been disappeared since 2006. There is another aspect of human rights violation which is called the kill and dump policy. The Pakistani security agencies, with the help of their collaborative auxiliary organization, which are known as the death, army's death squads. They pick up people, they torture them, and throw their mutilated bodies in desolate areas. And this is a routine affair in Balochistan. Hundreds of students, teachers, political activists, social activists, human rights activists, journalists, they have been killed in such, in such ways. Then there is a phenomena of mass graves. 
mass graves were found in many locations in, in Balochistan since 2011. So many actions of the Pakistani military in Balochistan can easily be termed a genocide act under the international laws and UN conventions. Then there is another aspect of human rights violation in Balochistan, which is the conversion of the of a secular Baloch society into a religious fundamentalist one. Thousands of religious schools uh, are sponsored by Pakistani military, where the the children are taught. Uh, very medieval version of religion. And they are trained or indoctrinated to become a jihadis or to convert the humanity into Islam. Then there is another aspect of human rights violation, which is the resource exploitation. Balochistan is one of the richest uh, re region in, the, in that part of the world. And Pakistan and China, they are collaborating and extracting gold, uranium, platinum, gas, oil. Even the Chinese trawlers, they have depleted the marine life in the Baloch coast, which has been the lifeline of the Baloch for centuries. Then there is Another aspect of cultural genocide, where the, an alien language, Urdu, has been imposed as the national language of Balochistan. And thousand years old cultural and social traditions of the Baloch are being ridiculed in school curriculum as un-Islamic. Un and in all practical purposes, the Baloch are living under the shadow of the sword of Pakistani military with its religious fundamentalist doctrines and human rights violation and genocide acts. It's a high time for the international community to, to raise voices against this brutal military machine of the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dashti. Our last speaker for today will join us again online. Um, that is Mr. Navid Walter. He is the founder and president of the NGO Human Rights Focus Pakistan. We'll wait a second until the connection is there. Thank you very much, uh, the host and the panelists, for raising uh, the atrocities and the important issues of Pakistan. And uh, I would like to uh, start from the beginning to uh, share the history and the base of such atrocities. Pakistan uh, was founded in 1947. And that time, the minority's population uh, was 23%. But unfortunately, in 1957, uh, it was shared that the minority's population is now 14%. And after that, as the time was passing, the minority's uh, population was going to decrease. Until 2017, the last census was conducted and the minorities don't know what is their exact population. And not only minorities were disagreed, but the people from Sindh and other parts also became dis disagreed about the population. That was the reason because the government was not agree to give the rights according to the population of minorities. In the same way, the Pakistan was 
uh, founded by the liberal uh, leader and he said that everyone is free to go to their churches temples worship places but after that the vision of the founding of pakistan was changed for example khaja nizamuddin said that the individuals have no concern with their personal matter the religion is a matter of the state that's a reason when the pakistan's amendment was going to be changed in 1947 in 1974 that was the second amendment and it was about to make the mdias community as a minority and after that there were many amendments and in uh, zial haq regime who was the dictator in his regime 15 amendments were made from 1985 to onward and the blasphemy laws were also made and amended in his regime 295a 295b and 295c unfortunately until now 2000 people have been victimized for blasphemy charges and present and 80 persons have been killed extra judicial has been lynching have been killed on the spots have been killed in the prisons have been killed in the streets have been killed during the court trials the two recent examples could show you the mindsets of people one a person who was working from the sri lanka in a sial court he was uh, murdered on a spot first they murdered and then they uh, burnt him alive and other example just a last month example of a city mia channu where a person was killed on the spot this show the mindset of people what the people wants this is not only by the religious uh, fanatics the extremist organizations it's also due to the state policy when the state said that they want to form a country on a model of medina state then why the people will not become radicalized the recent example a couple of days earlier a sitting minister of this government said that he want to become a suicider he want to attack the persons who are anti islam in a same way the minorities girls who are under age who are under 18 as the unicef said that the girls who are under 18 are minors so until now every year 1500 minority girls become abducted forcefully converted and forcefully married and the uh, bill was presented in the assembly but it was denied it was rejected to saying that this is an un-islamic there is a council of ideology that council actually decide which bill is contrary to islam or which is not contrary to islam so they rejected this bill so but minorities abduction is a big issue when this issue become happen from the start to end from the home to mosque to courts and to the shelter which government provided them all are biased the lawyers are under threats the judges are under threats the human rights organizations who provide them assistance 
or raise their voice, they are also under threats. The human rights defenders are under threats. The families are under threats. So there is no way when the girl go to detention of the abductors, there is no way to return back. So this is happening in Pakistan at right now. And the attitudes or behaviors are not changing. The government look not serious to make the changes of the people's mindset, to promote the religious harmony, to promote the tolerance, to promote the peace. And they want to prove that Pakistan was made for Islamization, unfortunately. The minorities have reservations on the constitutional articles. Many sections are discriminatory. The laws and practices are discriminatory. For example, Article 2 said that Islam shall be a state religion. Article 41 said, <coughs> sorry, the president shall be a Muslim. Article 91 said that prime minister shall be a Muslim. Article 25 said that everyone is equal to state. But this article don't define on the basis of religion, but only on the base of sex and gender. So this is a biased attitudes and behavior. This is a discriminatory practices and laws against minorities. In the same way, <coughs> the uh, many uh, things which government have taken steps is not in favor of the minorities. The minorities representation is also not a real representation because the minorities could not elect directly their representatives. These are just chosen by the government, the political parties, and they could choose anyone. And then these uh, representatives could not express their issues, which are really belonging to the religious minorities. Mr. Walter. I'm unsure if you yeah. can hear me. If I would ask you, due to our limited time, that you come to a conclusion. Yeah, I'm Thank summarizing. You. Thank you. I would like to raise such issues on international community. And I ask to pressurize the government of Pakistan to implement the covenants, the conventions, the UDHR, the ICCP articles 18 to 22, right of expression, assembly, association, and thought, including religious freedom. And also the United Nations asked to the world for agenda 2030 and sustainable development goals, which are 17, about equality, about uh, quality education, about justice, about human rights, and about no one leave behind. So Pakistan should press rise to implement the Agenda 2030 and sustainable development goals that the Pakistan could also come on a mainstream, could also come a part of world and not like the in a, to live in a isolation from the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Before moving on to the last item on our agenda, the Q&A session, I would like to take a second and thank you all in this room and also the people who joined our live stream for being here, for joining us, and on behalf of Global Human Rights Defense, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, now we're going to take some questions from the room and also from the people following on Zoom. So on Zoom, you can just uh, push on the button, which is at the bottom part of the screen, to raise your electronic hand. So don't hesitate to ask. But first, we're going to take uh, questions from the room, if there are some. Any questions? No? 
No question. One question here, one there. Here, please, lady, this lady. The mic is coming to you. Please uh, just tell your name and ask your question, please. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm a GHRD delegate, and my name is Victoria Walczyk. I have a question to uh, Dr. Uh, Luhana. Uh, so, in your opinion, what do you think could gradually improve the situation in Pakistan when it comes to human rights? Thank you very much. It's a really very important question. What we have seen that over the period of time, the human rights situation has worsened rather than any improvement. I give you an example. We made with the working group on enforced involuntary disappearances. Eight special reporters, they wrote to the Pakistan government and said that make the enforced disappearances criminal. So they passed a bill. Rather than making the enforced disappearances criminal, they say those people who say that their relatives or family is abducted by the army and intelligence agencies, they should provide the proof that the agencies are involved. If they fail to prove, provide the proof, they will be charged and they will be sent to prison. So, because wherever you see the dictatorial regimes and army is controlling the whole affairs, there isn't any hope. What is the hope? It is basically the international community. You see the conflict in Ukraine and Russia. Russia is a, is a big power. But because of the international pressure, because of the international sanctions, they are crumbling and they somehow, if not today, tomorrow, they have to recognize the rights of the Ukrainian people. So it is basically very, very important that it is the time. Internally, we have got no recourse to justice, no way. The only way, the only hope, because say, for example, I was giving an example uh, to Emma, that those people, six million people who were massacred in Holocaust, they didn't have the voice. It is the international community who came for their support and they, they, they get these, this whole Europe basically uh, freed. And this has to happen because Pakistan is a case and that international community has to increase the pressure. They have to increase basically the sanctions. For example, there is a GSP plus status. As a result of GSP plus status, Pakistan government gets 1.2 billion euros as a benefits. And there are a lot of others, say for example, over the last 20 years, US has provided aid, not loan, of almost in the, to, the, to the tune of 40 billion dollars. Uh, and that all goes to not to the public good, because uh, Lina was saying that the, the, the expenditure on health and education is total less than 3% in a country, while more than 67% goes to the military. So that military will not agree until unless there is a pressure from the international community, from the international human rights organizations like GHRD, and from the international community to put sanctions on Pakistan until unless they do not oblige to the fundamental, because the human rights are not, are not associated with any condition. It, these are universal. They do not oblige the human rights, there will be sanctions on Pakistan. And until unless we do not see any hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question in the back. Sir, actually, yes. my question being answered by uh, asked you, by Your name, lady. please. My question being asked, uh, asked by a young lady, and uh, Dr. Lohan explained, but I have to do it again. As the international community, especially USA, they know the Pakistan government is very brutal government, and they do many things, and they know about the genocide, and they helping the Taliban and they creating terrorism in Afghanistan all around the world. Why they don't take action? Instead of taking action, helping Pakistan military to bombardment the Baluch people and the other nation around them, the minority in the Pakistan. What is the reason for that? Thank you. Any of you can. Thank you. Who would like to answer on this? Because why? The U.S. is helping Pakistan. We should know the context of the creation of Pakistan. Pakistan was created by the British Empire. 
to safeguard its colonial interest in the Middle East and in Central and South Asia. They used, the, after the Second World War, when the colonial system was uh, crumbling, there are, there are, they created many, many client states. The Pakistan is one of the client states of the British Empire. And the U.S. Uh, inherited the legacy of the British Empire. So they think it's still the U.S. and the U.K. They are in the opinion that they can use Pakistan for their strategic and political or economic purposes. So unless until Pakistan is useful for them, they will supply arms, they will supply money, they will do any favor to Pakistan. That is the reason. Thank you very much. Is there any other question, sir? Uh, the mic is coming to you. Just a second. Thank you. My question is also, uh, my name is Samad Baloch. My question is also related uh, with the earlier two questions. Yes, he's talking to the mic. Yes. Can you? That's fine. Yeah. My question is also related to the questions already raised uh, that um, as the panelist all uh, mentioned that human rights abuses in Pakistan are rampant. They are increasing day by day. Uh, serious uh, human rights violation, cultural human rights violation, genocides, uh, a systematic genocide of uh, Baloch, Sindhis, Pashtuns in Pakistan, uh, even uh, China that you were talking about, yogurts, are happening. But uh, how could uh, um, uh, the panelists um, uh, could advise us, how could the international community or the civilized world will be convinced uh, to make sanctions on Pakistan or stop uh, Pakistan or China doing all these abuses. Uh, how could they be like they're do, helping uh, Ukraine now? Baluchistan was also uh, an independent country. It was annexed similarly like Russia is trying to annex Ukraine. Similarly, we were a sovereign country. We were annexed by force. Uh, so how could we convince um, the international community uh, or the civilized world to intervene before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like to um, to react on this. See, um, by having a protest in front of the UN building will not help. That is an institution that is totally. They have their own meetings, and in fact, there are so many problems in the world. The only reason is, as you can see, I will give you a very clear mes uh, example. You know, the, the, what's happened with the Rohingyas. It's because of a lot of Islamic countries start pushing to the UN that they have to take action. And the UN only take action when there is a pressure from outside. And as long as the Baloches alone, as long as the Sindhi people are protesting alone, there is no international pressure. And they have, and you need, to, the lobbying network must be on a higher level. And that is what we forget. We think by doing a protest, there is not even, I think nobody will notice that because they never come outside to see what is happening outside. And this is where I think it's failed that we need to set up a more structured communication, lobbying and networking. And there is what the Baloch and there is that for networking and you need also resources. And if you don't have resources, you cannot do that. And if you see two other organizations, I, I can give you a sample that the, with the Rohingyas, the Saudis have pushed a lot of money into that, that we have a lot of, uh, um, every news channel had this as, a, as a agenda, and that is what make it popular. If you, if you see advertising of Coca-Cola, then you believe that this is the only drink you can buy. So, and nowadays news channels are totally only focusing a few minutes. So, when we started this organization 20 years ago, we, we come to know that nobody reads reports anymore. We are in a different time zone now. So, we started two years ago to set up a basic human rights TV channel, 24 hours, only human rights violation. And 
the first message when we announced it that we want to do that, the only message we got, very emotional from the Yazidis. And they said, this you should, we should have long time ago because when everything was happened and we were all, really, our girls will have been raped and kidnapped, then CNN came, then BBC came, but then it was too late. And same is happening in Balochta. For the media, it's not interesting because they cannot sell it. We are depending on the international media and the international media is commercial. They want to have the clicks, they want to have their, their selling point and they will want to put it on the front page and you can put anything on Pakistan, it will just say half a day and it will disappear. It's all about networking and I think it's good that the sir said we need to find like-minded NGOs that can work together and when we work together, it's going to cost less resources, but also we can more be more effective. Thank you. Yeah, there's one more question there, sir. If I, if I may just, uh, just you want to add quick. something? Just go ahead, shortly. It's, it's okay, it works. Okay. Just uh, speak close to the mic. If I may just uh, quickly add on China. By the way, the Mr. Winter, the magazine, my magazine deals a lot with religious liberty and human rights violation in Pakistan as well. And there is an interesting uh, uh, meeting point uh, where China, Pakistan and Afghanistan meet. And we should, we should um, study that more carefully. It's interesting what China is doing against Muslim people in Xinjiang and elsewhere while fueling some other um, or, uh, terroristic Islamic organization uh, bothering India, for example, and other places. So it's interesting what they are trying to do. But to go back to your to your question, I don't have an answer. Basically, I have um, I, I try as a journalist to see what happens, and what happens is that first of all, um, for the, the, the genocide that the CCP is waging against Tibetans, Mongolians, and and Uyghurs, for example, has been uh, quite widely denounced by a few parliaments in the West, starting from the U.S. Congress, going to the Netherlands, and, and, uh, and, can and Canada also. So there are political forces and uh, parliamentary forces who are openly recognizing that what is going on in China is genocide. And I'm using this, um, uh, this word carefully and shivering. Because genocide, as lawyers know, is not, is not a synonym to slaughter, mainly. It has a, a, a technical, legal connotation since uh, Raphael Lemkin and, and, and those days. So when you target someone with a, a, an accusation of genocide, you're doing something very precise and very, um, very important. So there are parliaments who are recognizing China as a genocidal uh, force. This is very important. We need to, to work on that. We need to make people know because many people don't know. On the, on the other hand, uh, as usual, follow the money. China is a powerful economic um, state and this may, have, um, this may help us understand why while some parliaments recognize genocide, some others don't. I come from a country, Italy, that has assigned an awful memorandum of agreement of a merely political um, nature with China. We are almost kneeling down a genocidal um, state and we do nothing. So this is not an answer, but it's a comment on what you're uh, saying. There are hopes, um, concrete hopes, because when you have parliaments acting, this is a concrete hope, but we need to do more. Thank you. So one more question, and then we will have to wrap up. Thank you, sir. Hello. So my question is that human rights situation in China and Pakistan, this is the subject. Uh, especially if you are um, an NGO's organization working about human rights violation, China is not violating uh, the human rights, is it not today? It's a decade, not only nationally, internationally. They violating uh, human rights in uh, Africa. They 
took the resources and rather they kill the Africans in the Baluchistan and Sin. We have a port there under here lease in uh, under the Pakistani umbrella, China violating the law. We are the ind indigenous people of Sin. They grabbing our land by hundred year according this is a not constitutionally and law, but they are um, interest. European interest, American interest, they allow to China exploit the resources. China is exploiting resources in Africa, in Asia, and uh, in Indian subcontinent. Please, uh, can yes. we ask your question, please? Yeah, this is the, my question. Is human right violation of the China's? If you didn't talk about, you only, uh, uh, uh, prospect of uh, minorities uh, they violating China, but not uh, it's a so many part China violating the law. Uh, so why did you didn't work about that and other cases of China? Uh, okay, they I are understand. violating. Who would like to answer this question? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I am uh, talking like China. that. China, China is exploiting the resources in Africa in Asia. For example, I give to the example. I'm uh, indigenous people yeah, of uh, yeah, please, uh, Baluchistan. Just repeat and your Sin. question, please. And uh, question is don't... that is a port Qasim. It's a port. Pakistan unconstitutionally and over to the uh, China for hundred years. This is unconstitutionally. They violate the law. They violate our sea. They they they they involve in the fish genocide. I'm sorry, for sir. Example. I have to interrupt you. Yeah. Please ask again clearly your question, so we. So can I, yes, can uh, my question is Yes, but what is your question? So you were asking, if I understand, yeah. why are you talking about only these cases in China and not cases of human rights violations in other parts of China? Yeah. So why do you focus only on this? I don't know who can answer. Uh, if Shocking. I understand correctly the question, uh, wh wh why do we concentrate on only on some regions? Yes. Uh, well, I we do not concentrate. Just a moment. I think he was asking, why we are concentrating on the minority rights where China is violating? Why we are not talking about other human rights which China is violating in Asia? Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you. Well, I think just because we have a short time today, uh, I have a long list of violations, as I mentioned, I can share with, this, uh, with you. I uh, co-run a magazine which day, on a daily basis documents violation in China and elsewhere, but let's uh, remain on China, uh, everywhere, in all regions of China, a violation of human rights and religious liberty. We consider religious liberty the chief human rights and also the, the first political human rights. So this is why we concentrate on, on religious liberty. But there are all sorts of violations uh, in China, violation of human rights against minorities, I don't like this word, against non-Han people, many times, often times, several times, uh, we are speaking of millions of people, so no, it's not minority, but also against people in Hong Kong, as you know. Uh, they are trying also to get to Taiwan, as you know. They are harassing also Han people. Uh, there is a huge section in, in uh, in the bitter winter, and it was part of my written uh, paper today uh, on uh, the, the famous one-child policy, which is which is targeting all diff all kind of of, uh, of people, um, minorities and non-minorities. Uh, economic freedom in uh, in China is strictly controlled by the state; is limited by the state. It's a violation of of a fundamental human rights. We can go on. Uh, for, for, I mean, Bitter Winter is out there for you to read if, you, if you're interested. Thank you very much. I think um, we will have to, to leave it there. As you just said, it's probably, it could take us hours going around and talking about all the human rights violations, and for very unfortunately for sure, talking about all the human rights violations uh, in all countries and in the world. Uh, thank you for this, uh, for this presentation, for this involvement. Thank you to you all for being here. Thanks to 
all those who followed us on Zoom and online on our website, www.pressclub.ch. And uh, I still wish you a, a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Have a good day.